Thank you, and good morning. Thank you for being here on such a snowy morning. My uh, slides are detailed, and I apologize for those in advance, but I figured that maybe a handout would be more useful than you taking notes. So we'll make our way through the slides as best we can. And what I intend to focus on is really leadership in a turnaround. I've been to these section, sessions before, and we've had eminent speakers talk about the philosophy of leadership and the behaviors of leadership. We're not talking about those things today. We're talking about leadership in a turnaround. And what I hope to cover is what is a turnaround, um, signs of trouble, uh, what does a leader encounter in a turnaround, uh, getting buy-in for a turnaround plan and what's involved in, in that process, the, the planning process, the framework for planning a turnaround, liquidity, cash, and the financial plan. So we'll talk about some examples as we go through the process. But uh, uh, this is kind of a time-honored tradition, I think, in these sessions that we always start with definitions. So I thought I'd better not back tradition this morning. I'd better start with the definition. And you'd all be familiar with this one. Management is about rational decision making, and the output of management is decisions, and the output of good management is the right decision. I've, I've heard this before sitting where you are today. Leadership then is about creating a collective commitment to delivering high performance, and the output of leadership is action. Well, what's missing for me in that definition of leadership is e execution. There's nothing in there about execution. And yet the essence of a turnaround is execution. So the question is, really, is leadership in a turnaround somehow different? Do leaders need to be good at execution? This is a chart that I came across in the Harvard Business Review a little while back. It has puzzled me ever since I saw it. It's a bit hard to make up, but what it really is saying is out of 700 people surveyed by the authors of this article, 16% of them felt that their leaders were very effective at strategy, poor execution. 8% of them thought they were good at both. So if we're talking about the definition of leadership, for me, I think the definition of leadership is really about execution. Another busy slide. But the takeaway here is that leaders have to be effective at both. They have to be effective at leading strategy and executing on that strategy. Now, I wonder if you know who said culture eats strategy for breakfast. Anybody know that? It's a Druckerism. What Drucker was saying is that culture is the determining factor in being able to execute strategy. And for me, culture is sustainability. If you're going to build in a performance of some kind, it's the culture that's going to make that sustainable. So my definition of leadership really is all about producing a high performance culture. I want to give you an example. I yeah, once became CEO of a company called Loomis. Loomis is an armored car business. When I became the CEO of it, it was the third largest armored car business in the US after Brinks and Wells Fargo Armored. We had 125 armored car terminals from Alaska to Florida. We had about 5,000 employees. We had thousands of trucks. We transported hundreds of millions of dollars every day. The original Loomis had been a great company. It had been a West Coast operator, it had been founded by Chuck Loomis. He was up in the Klondike in the old days. He had the dog sled, he went up and he got the gold, and he brought it back. And this culture of Chuck Loomis and the Klondike was firmly entrenched in Loomis. Then Loomis began an acquisition strategy. It bought Pure Lenner Armored Car, it bought Texas Armored Car, it bought things in the Northeast, it bought all these acquisitions, it expanded geographically, became a national carrier, and it lost the Loomis way. So, how does, how does culture eat strategy here? Well, you would be forgiven for thinking that in a business like the armored car business, the culture would be built on risk management. 
specific of billions of dollars. Risk management is about your people and about your trucks, the things that are transporting the money. Well, when I came into the business, we paid close to minimum wage. We hired folks who many times weren't able to get into the police force. They wanted to wear a uniform. They wanted to pack a gun. They were just itching to shoot somebody. <laughs> and, and so, in fact, many bought their own weapons to work, filed down the trigger. I mean, these guys were really out there with a single purpose. They, they really wanted to have a firefight, but there was no culture of safety associated with that. So despite operating thousands of trucks, there was no culture of taking care of them either. So here we had risk around people and equipment but no culture around people and equipment. So we had road accidents, lots of road accidents, cost us money. We had trucks going down the highway, back doors would fly open, a million dollars would fly out, We'd never to be recovered. As the, as the cash flies out the back of the truck, that's money coming off your EBITDA. Okay, this stuff is not insured above self-retention levels. So any lost dollar hits our P&L. We had internal theft, lots of internal theft, 125 terminals, people walking in and out all the time, a dollar for you, a dollar for me. Internal theft was a big problem. We had terminals taken down. We had people actually planned to rob our terminals. They would go in, execute our employees, and drive out with trucks of money. Cash flying out the door. We had shoot them outs across the street. Now imagine, guy comes out of the bank, he's got a bag of money, there's probably $10,000 in the bag. The bad guys come up for a shootout, they kill, our dry, they kill our, our employee, which costs us $250,000 in the soft retention piece of the workers' compensation claim, and, and they took $10,000. Wouldn't you rather they just gave the guy the $10,000 and came home safely? So these are examples of of culture gone wrong. In that year that I took over that business, that cost of risk that I was just describing was $25, for the, $25 million a year. With no change in strategy, that cost of risk three years later was $12 million. So with no change in strategy, there was $13 million extra dollars of earnings in the business because of a change in culture. So culture does eat strategy for breakfast. You have to do the basic things right, and that's the cultural story. So by caring about our assets, by caring about our people, by investing in our people, by investing in our trucks, by forbidding shootouts across the street, by having um, standard operating procedures about coming home safely, about wearing bulletproof vests, those guys that were sashaying around with their firearms waiting for a shootout, they never wanted to wear a bulletproof vest. But when we wrote to their wives and explained how the life insurance policy worked only if they were wearing a bulletproof vest, guess what? They all came to work wearing bulletproof vests. So the takeaway here is that left unnurtured, culture will default to the lowest common denominator. Leadership is about culture. So what is a turnaround? Well, a turnaround is obviously a distressed company. Typically, it's losing money running out of working capital. Bankers have lost their patience with the business. Management's lost the confidence of shareholders, the lenders, the customers, the employees. Good employees are leaving. The remaining employees are disheartened, demotivated. That's a turnaround. They come in varying degrees, of course. There are companies that are in transition. And then there's the blood and guts turnaround where everything's up for grabs. And we'll talk about some examples of those. But why do companies get into trouble? Well, there's often an, a, a single product business, an over-reliance on a single product. There's a single customer reliance. You know the Walmart syndrome. You start a business, suddenly you land Walmart as a customer. Now you grow like crazy and Walmart changes their supplier and you're left with not much else for a business. So the single product uh, Walmart syndrome can be a typical problem. Industries in structural transition. In this country, for the last decade or so, many, many manufacturers have moved to low labor across countries, and that's been really structural. Cyclical industries, housing, commodities, 
um, failures to address risk. We've recently seen examples, food safety risk, um, a classic example. Failure to integrate acquisitions is uh, a very common reason why companies get into trouble. And perhaps that's a good place for me to start to, to tell you about how I got into this business in the first place. I, uh, as you heard in the introduction, started life as a lawyer. I, I reformed early and uh, became an uh, investment manager. I ran a small investment company. And I had the sense that what I was doing wasn't really close enough to value adding. I wanted to be somebody that added value. Has anybody ever read any Ayn Rand? You familiar with Ayn Rand? So Ayn Rand was really a, uh, a kind of an extreme capitalist. And, and in her world and in her books, people fall into two groups. You either create value or you're someone who lives off the value creators. Well, I was just reading Ayn Rand and I kind of felt like I was in the wrong group. I wanted to be in the value added group. So I came across a company called Cormark. Cormark had been in the news at that time quite a bit for reasons that will become apparent to you. And I thought, well, maybe I should have a, have a look at this business. Cormark had uh, two and a half billion dollars a year in revenues. It was a warehouse distribution business. It had uh, 37,000 convenience stores and supermarkets and converted gasoline stations to which it distributed consumer products. That was the essence of the business. 20,000 SKUs, 3,000 employees, warehouses from Canada to right throughout the US. But it was a poorly integrated roll-up. The two and a half billion dollars had been accumulated by a series of acquisitions that had never been integrated. So you had a different way of going to market in each region that was really reflective of how the old companies did business. There was no new culture around this business. The chairman had had this uh, tendency to bail out his friends from their failing businesses. So in addition to this distribution business, Cormark owned resorts off the coast of Honduras. It had a furniture manufacturing business. It had a telephone and a connect business. It was in the fast food business. It had a fleet of jets. It had offices all over the place. What you, what you had was a guy that had built this, this organization to fund a lifestyle. What a lifestyle. This guy had taken the company public at $18 a share, it hadn't made money in it ever since, and the stock was in rapid decline. But he owned all the voting shares, and the institutional investors owned the non-voting shares. So as much as they were unhappy with performance, there was not much they could do about it. He was firmly entrenched. So here was my opportunity. I went, took myself to the investors and I said, I can fix this business. And of course, they didn't want to talk to me. They were too busy suing the chairman to try and get him to convert their non-voting shares into voting shares. The chairman, on the other hand, was ill. He had taken the jet down to El Salvador, where he had met a young man who uh, apparently was a hairdresser, but he liked him enough to adopt him as a son and bring him back to his home in Hollywood. And, and the two of them uh, then took another trip down to El Salvador in the company jet and brought back a young El Salvadorian girl who they adopted. And it wasn't long before the welfare department had to take the girl away from them. And the young adopted son went to jail for 10 years for molesting the adopted daughter. And the chairman retired to his uh, home off Vancouver to die of AIDS. So all this is in the newspapers. This had to be an opportunity for a guy who was looking to add value, right? I figured out a way to get control of Cormark by buying the chairman's shares in a trust that didn't convert the non-voting shares into voting shares. And I went to the stock exchange and I announced myself as the new chairman of Cormark. And immediately the investors all sued me. The banks froze the bank account the stock went down to $1.80. The uh, board of the company aligned along party lines. There were those that represented the institutional investors who didn't want to know me for those reasons, and there were those that didn't represent the chairman who were seeing the writing on the wall already, and they weren't happy. And 
the Teamsters decided to picket the business. So all those things happened about the time I announced that I was the chairman of Cormark. I had my, oh my God moment, suddenly arrive. The question was, was I enough of a leader to unite all these stakeholders behind my turnaround plan? Well, we'll get back to that story in a moment. Let's talk about signs of trouble. And these are signs of trouble apart from the fact that the company might be losing money and employees and customers. The, th the signs of trouble are typically cultural. If, if, if the company has, these are the sort of things you want to look at when you're walking around a business. You're trying to get a feel for the business. Do people know what their market position is? Do they have a sense of what the competitive advantage of the company is? Do they have written action plans? Do they, are they able to, to articulate their priorities and, and know where they are on their priorities? Is there a sense of urgency in the business? Is senior management aware of the details? Do they even know what break even is? We'll get back to break even a little bit in a while. But if managers don't know their monthly targets and, and, and metrics aren't being tracked, and the head of HR and the head of distribution and the head of manufacturing and the head of production and head of sales and the head of marketing don't all know their numbers and how those numbers roll up into a corporate performance, then that's trouble. That's their signs of trouble. If there's no current organization plan, that's a problem. Organization charts tell you how people are aligned to achieve goals. So if the organizational chart is out of date, what does that tell you about the business? Poor housekeeping is a great one. Uh, if you have dirty warehouses, if you have untidy factories, if you have dirty fleets, if uh, you are not concerned about employee appearances, that's telling you something about the culture of the business. I, I spent a lot of time in Japan visiting customers and I went to a plant one time where the, there was a place for everything, everything was in its place, including the marks on the floor with the name of each employee where the employee stood. Now, we wouldn't necessarily do that in North America, but that does tell you something about where, where um, housekeeping can be taken in terms of building a culture. <coughs> From a financial point of view, habitual addbacks are a great clue. We, we would have made money if only, is what I call it. You read down the P&L, you get to the net income line, it looks really terrible, and then you look at all the addbacks. But if we hadn't had this expense, and if we hadn't had that expense, we could have made money. It's that we could have made money. It's one of the early signs of a problem. So what does the new leader encounter? What this slide is really telling you about is the new leader encounters very little cash and very little reliable data. Matter of fact, it's the lack of reliable data that is the reoccurring theme in turnarounds. You're going to have to develop information. You're going to have to develop proxies for information. No one wants to be accountable. And so you make decisions based on less than full information. Essentially, you're stepping into a leadership vacuum. OK, so now you're on the burning platform. You're responsible. The burning platform demands a response. Forget about sleep. Forget about friends and family. Total immersion. I have a sort of a motivational proverb that I always, it always comes to mind when I go into a turnaround and I don't, maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. But it talk, it's, it's the story about the lion and the gazelle. Do you, do you know the story? Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must outrun the fastest lion if it's going to survive. Every morning in Africa, the lion wakes up. It knows that it must outrun the slowest gazelle if it wants to st avoid starvation. So it doesn't matter whether you're the lion or the gazelle. When the sun comes up in the morning, you'd better be running. And that's the story of the turnaround. There is no time for anything. You need to buy time. You need to buy time to get the analytics done. And at the same time, you need to be steadying the ship. You need to be Visible, confident, you need to be a safe pair of hands. So let's look at the analytics for a moment. What we're really talking about doing here 
is trying to do analyze what's wrong. What could be achieved if it was being done right? How capable is the organization of actually delivering? What is the new value proposition? What is the new vision going to be? Then you've got to write the plan, fund the plan, you've got to engage the employees to buy into the plan, and while all of this is going on, you cannot neglect the business. So turnaround leadership is really pragmatic leadership. We've got to get the buy-in from all the stakeholders that we talked about. There's a lot of actions that you're going to be taking. And these actions are going to involve pain. There's going to be pain at all levels of the business. Look at the things that you're going to be doing. You're going to be closing inefficient plants. You're going to be downsizing operations. You're going to be dropping unprofitable customers, reducing headcount. There's enough pain to go around here, and so it's essential that buy-in is obtained from all of the stakeholders as soon as possible. And frankly, you're going to have to fund the plan, and that requires buy-in. So buy-in from the board. You've got to unite the board. The board's done one good thing. It's hired you. But it's probably been unable to agree on much for some time. So uniting the board is pretty important. Some directors may still like the old CEO. Some aren't going to want you to replace the, new, the, replace the CFO. Some of, you aren't going, some of them aren't going to want you to sell the business that they just bought. So uniting the board is critical. The banks. Yours is not going to be the first new plan the bank has heard by this time. The bank would be skeptical. They're going to want to take whatever cash you can generate to reduce their position, the cash you need to fund operations. Oftentimes for a banker, Agreeing to support a turnaround plan is a career decision. If he does and the turnaround doesn't happen, that will be held against the banker. So convincing the bank to come along with you is a leadership job. You have to convince the bank to support you. Shareholders need leadership too. They need to be brought on the journey. Shareholders may have to put more money in or they may have to make room for a new investor to fund the plan. In either case, Shareholders need leadership too. That can be a little more complicated because questions of value start to arise. And let me go back to the Cormark story to give you an example of that. During the lawsuits and the boardroom struggles that I described earlier when I was talking about the early days of getting control of Cormark, what the shareholders really wanted me to do was to convert the non-voting shares into voting so that they could take control of the business and do what they wanted to. That didn't suit my purpose, so of course I wasn't going to do that. The plan was not the issue. They sort of understood the turnaround plan. The real issue was, who puts the new money in and how does it get put in? Obviously, when you put new money into a turnaround, you're not going to put it in at the same level as the old equity that's more or less gone. You want to put it in in priority to the old equity. But you're not going to get it in ahead of the banks because they've got the security. So this struggle of subordination and... and uh, uh, priority of returns becomes very important to the funding of a turnaround and bringing the shareholders along on the journey is a critical piece of that. In Cormac, we agreed to uh, put money in as convertible debt. So that meant that we would be above the equity that was theoretically gone. We would be below the senior debt, which was secured. And we could pay ourselves a current return, an interest rate, because we called it convertible debt. And in fact, we paid ourselves 12% interest, which was a nice current return. And we had a conversion right to convert the debt into equity at $1.80 a share. You remember I told you the IPO was done at 18. It went to $1.80 when they heard that I was going to be the new CEO. And so $1.80 seemed about the right price for us to be able to convert our debt to equity. Well, the, the, to bring the shareholders on board, we had to give them a piece of that. So we put in two-thirds of, of the new money on those terms, and we offered a third of the new money to the shareholders on the same terms. So those that had bought in at $18 could now average down their cost of entry to some average of between $18 and $1.80. They could get a current return, and as the turnaround worked, they would share in the upside. So they were, they were able to accept that and come on board. 
we were, in a sense, united as shareholders. There's a, another whole conversation we could have about maintaining communications with shareholders, um, which would be the subject of another day. But buying means building a shared commitment, and it means building a shared commitment from everybody, from all the stakeholders. And that includes your customers and your suppliers. Customers in a turnaround are going to have been disappointed by late deliveries, probably by poor quality, and they're probably already looking at alternative sources of supply. Suppliers, they're not getting paid or they're getting paid late. They're starting to demand cash on delivery. They're reducing shipments. They're prioritizing other customers. So your shipments are late. And if you haven't got raw materials and your production lines slow down, and that's a vicious circle. So getting buy-in from customers and suppliers is very important. The other thing about customers and suppliers, remember, cash is key in a turnaround. And I've had some pretty terrific support from customers who will pay early. I've had terrific support from suppliers who will extend terms. Both things free up cash. I've even had suppliers who have converted what we owe them as a payable into a piece of debt for payment a year or two down the road. That creates terrific amounts of cash that allows you to fund the turnaround plan. Most importantly though, you need buy-in from the management team and the employees. You know, employees don't usually come to work to fail. If a company's failing, it's not the employees, it's the leadership that's the problem. So don't go into a turnaround thinking that you're going to lay off lots and lots of employees, because that's not where the problem lies. Oftentimes, by engaging with the employees in the planning process, you're going to find out what's really wrong with the business. They're working in it every day. They know where the problems are. And if you can engage them in the analysis and engage them in the solutions and engage them in the planning, then you're going to have terrific buy-in. And if the time comes where you do have to lay employees off, as you probably will, don't do it by death of a thousand cuts. Do it in one go. Have one day when you let the employees go that you need to let go. And from then on, you begin to rebuild the confidence. So now we're at the planning stage. What do we need to do to plan? We've got to focus on cash. We've got to do our situational analysis. We have to identify the value proposition. Then we develop the business plan and we develop the financial plan. On a chart, it would look something like this. So you've got your planning down the side and you've got your implementation across the top. Of course, this looks sequential. This looks, from an analytical and planning perspective, as if you do one through seven sequentially. In fact, you're doing everything at the same time. From, a, from an implementation point of view, it's helpful to think more in terms of 30 and 60 and 90 day plans and the first year. So while we talk about these things sequentially, we're working on them all at once. And the first thing we're going to look at is vision and strategy. What, what, what are we good at? Are we a high value product? Are we a high value producer? Are we a low cost guy? Is there a hybrid strategy? Is there a last man standing strategy? What's the strategy? Identify the new vision. Well, let's go back to our examples of Cormark and Loomis as perhaps uh, examples of identifying value. Cormark, you remember, was a warehouse distribution business supplying consumer products to convenience stores. Improving operational efficiencies in the core distribution business meant getting costs as low as we could, and that clearly was part of the strategy. Get cost out. But the second part of the strategy was really driving up margins, improving margins. Cormark at the time was an 8% gross margin business. We needed to get it up to 14%, 15% gross margin business. So we needed to have really a hybrid strategy. Low cost, high value add. And so the real competitive advantage for Cormark lay in developing these value added strategies for our customers. If you think about it, our customers were convenience stores mostly associated with gas stations. The people who worked in them were people who mostly pumped gas. They weren't retailers. 
but they were owned by the chevrons of the world that had 5,000 of these or 7,000 of these, and they were concerned about how their stores should be retailed. So if the, distrib if the distributor of the consumer products, instead of delivering those products to the back door, went into the store, planogrammed the store, put the products on the shelves, merchandised the products, price pointed the products, developed promotional materials for the products, essentially the distributor could deliver the chevrons of the world a predictable gross margin per square foot return on inventory. In other words, a highly predictable outcome. This was value added. This was seriously value added. Now, if what Cormark could also do was have an automatic replenishment program driven by the, the sales that went through the cash register, then automatic replenishment meant that it was getting harder and harder for those convenience stores to change their supplier. So there's a strategy that we could get behind in Cormark. And once we'd identified the strategy, we had something we could do with it. We could align the organization to deliver that strategy. So then, of course, the plan was to analyze the profit drivers, look at the cost efficiencies, route optimization, sales contribution analysis, and then rebuild the organization to be able to de deliver on those things. Cormark today has $11 billion a year in sales. It's a very successful business. So how did it work in Loomis? So Loomis was this armored car business that I told you about. It was really a transportation business. We, the inventory was cash, and if you lost the inventory, you had a little trouble, but it was really just a, 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 a price-driven commodity business. So of course, if you're price-driven, you'd better be low cost. And we had to look at reducing costs and improving efficiencies to compete. But was, was there a value-added opportunity? And in those days, the banking business itself was going through an evolution, and that did present value-added opportunities. The first thing that Loomis was able to do was to take on large chains of ATM machines. ATM machines were coming out in the day and replacing bricks and mortar for banks. ATM machines were, were long chains of, of, of a thousand machines. And if a machine went down, it cost the bank money. So if Loomis could get into first-line maintenance of ATM machines and cash replenishment of ATM machines, that had value to the bank. If Loomis guaranteed uptime of, a, of, a, of an ATM machine, that had value to the bank. So now we could move up the value curve a bit. We could get away from being a merely price-driven business to something that had some value. Now at the same time, we realized that the banks really didn't need physical delivery of the cash. What they needed was the information that the cash represented. So our old business, go to the bank, pick up the cash, drive around, dropping the cash off to all the retail customers. End of the day, drive around all the retail customers, pick up the cash, drive down to the bank. We didn't have to do that anymore. What we had to do was keep the cash in our terminal, take it to the retailers, and bring it back at night, and count it. Tell the bank what the deposits were, tell the retailers what their deposits were. By doing that, we saved the retailers about three days of float. And in these low interest rates environments, float doesn't mean very much. But in the old days, when interest rates were 6 or 7 or 8%, float meant a lot. If you had to wait three days for a deposit to be credited in your account, and you were Chevron with 5,000 convenience stores, that was a lot of value. Suddenly, we're getting paid for delivering information instead of delivering cash. Those cash vault services that we started to provide then enabled us to become an agent for the Federal Reserve, because we could move money out of a cage that was a Bank of America cage, right into the cage next to it in our terminal that was a Federal Reserve cage. And as you know, banks have to deposit for the Fed overnight all the time. We were doing the physical version of that. And we were, in fact, an agent of the Fed in Alaska, in Arizona, in Hawaii, in all kinds of places. So that's an example of how you would get into a turnaround. You would identify the value proposition, and then you would look to build an organizational capability around that value proposition. Loomis, to finish that story, uh, we merged it with Wells Fargo Armored uh, two years into the turnaround. Suddenly we had 15,000 employees and we were the largest in the country. Um, 
It became Loomis Fargo and Company. Um, it was then sold to Securitas and is today still called Loomis and is the largest cash management company in the United States. So back to our framework. We've done the uh, envisioning, we've identified the strategies, and now we want to focus on capability. Organizational capability, process capability, and support process capability. Now, I don't have time today to go through all these things. This is uh, a lot of detail. What I have done is uh, given you a few slides that list the sort of things you would look at doing by functional department. What you want to do here is you want to come up with detailed action plans. You want to be able to say over here what those actions are going to be and then add columns that talk about the detail of those actions, responsibilities for delivering those actions, timelines for delivering those actions, and as you roll these up, you come up with the detailed turnaround plan. This is a slide which is just a blow up of one of the sections of one of those three pages. This is the slide that talks about analyzing management. It's pretty straightforward. You get into a new company, analyze existing capabilities. Select the team. Who's going to be in the team and who isn't? Weed out those that are going to be impediments to the team. Hire missing skill sets. Try hiring talented people into a company that's losing money. You better have some leadership skills. And of course, you want to tie compensation to the achievement of the turnaround objectives. We talk about changing culture. Culture is a lot of things. But one of the things it is is what motivates people. And part of the motivation, of course, has to do with compensation and um, equity plans and bonus plans and those kinds of things. So I don't think we've got time to go through all of these things. Breaking down silos is perhaps one we could talk about. When you get into a, uh, a business that's struggling, you find that the silos don't really communicate with each other. The folks in accounting just can't believe what those manufacturing guys are doing. What, what, what could they be thinking about? And the manufacturing guys are saying, well, we don't believe these numbers. These accountants haven't got any idea what we're doing. And so it goes through warehousing and distribution and marketing and sales. The silos are very real. And if you can't get the accounting guys to go sit with the manufacturing guys and say, look, look at this variance in your, in your standard cost system. Let's try and understand what's going on here. If you can't get that uh, collective work going on, if people are stuck in their silos, the turnaround is doomed. So that's an important bullet, breaking down the silos. Get a culture going of decision, a culture data-based decision making. Uh, and then, as I said, the bonus and incentive plans become pretty important. So that's a, that's a breakdown of, I think, uh, those two, just as an example of what we're talking about. Back to our chart. We're now talking about Liquidity. Liquidity is number six on the framework, but of course it's always top of mind. You need to know if you can make payroll next week. This is where it's the gazelle on the lion time. When the sun comes up in the morning, you'd better be running. This is what I call the 13-week cash flow forecast. This is the tool that you live by in a turnaround. It's the roadmap. It takes time to get it right. You do the first one, you do the second one, and by the time you've been doing these every week for about three or four months, they start to work. But it takes really that long to get a 13-week cash flow forecast really working well. well. How does it work? You put in your collections for week one, two, three, four, five, all the way out to week 13. As best you know, your collections. That's your cash coming in. You then put in your operating expenses, and you're going to put some lines down here. You're going to have wages, you're going to have raw materials, you're going to have utilities, you're going to have whatever those buckets of outgoings are that are easily identifiable, and you put them in various lines under your operating expenses. And then you've got your collections list, your operating expenses, and you've got some cash. From the cash, you may or may not be able to fund some capex, some capital expenditures that you may need to do. If you can't fund CapEx, then the number in that column or in that row is always zero. 
After you've funded your capex, you've now arrived at a, at a line which is cash available for debt service. This is the part the bank wants to hear about. Will you be able to pay us on time? Typically in a turnaround, the answer is no. So this becomes a very important document because now you're starting to juggle, do I pay the bank or do I pay the wages? And the, the process of building this plan is a process of figuring out who can we pay, who can we defer, and how long can we defer them? How long can we create the cash? And then as the plan develops, the turnaround plan develops, you get to add in proceeds from the sale of assets. You've got a plant you're going to close, you've got assets you're going to sell, salvage value on equipment. You can start to bring other forms of cash back into the plan. If you are in a turnaround like the ones I've been in, there's all kinds of second quality inventory sitting in a warehouse somewhere that has got no value, but if you could flush it out, will convert into cash. If you've done the downsizing, you can start to add back into your forecast the reduced the benefits of re reduced payroll. And so the turnaround plan, or rather the, the uh, uh, cash flow forecast, begins to evolve as you go through the turnaround plan. So it's negative in the early months of the turnaround, and it requires significant leadership to start making those decisions about who's going to get paid and who's going to get left behind. We could spend probably quite a lot of time on how to do a cash flow forecast, but we don't have that time today. So let's get on with the financial analysis. Cash, we've talked about. These are the things that we were focused on in preparing the 13-week cash flow forecast. But now we're going to talk about profitability enhancements. What is the financial steps or what's the financial impact of the steps that you're going to take in executing the turnaround plan? Well, product contribution analysis, customer contribution analysis, these are things that are easy to do and, and really essential to understanding where your short-term gains are going to come from. Let's go back to our examples and talk about a couple of them. In Cormark, we did an analysis in the first month I was in the business of all of the sales in that month, and we found that more than 90% of sales were unprofitable. Well, on an annualized basis, we had $2.5 billion worth of sales. And if 90% of them were unprofitable, what were we going to do? Just fire all our customers? No. Simple regression analysis by transaction. If we could, in Cormark, change the profile of the business, if we could increase minimum order sizes, if we could reduce the frequency of delivery, would that tip a customer into being profitable? If we could charge for breaking bulk because the customer only wanted one bottle of ketchup instead of the way they came packed in six packs, could we upcharge and get the customer to flip from being unprofitable into profitable? Could we adjust payment terms and have them pay in 14 days instead of 30 days? Would that tip them over? So as a result of the regression analysis, we went through every customer we had in the business Thank God for pivot tables, by the way. And we were able to say, with all of these customers, we will do one or more or all of those things. And at the end of the process, um, all but 2% of the customers became profitable pieces of business. So for the last 2% of the customers in those days, um, we went, and went out and we bought 50 cash and carries from Price Club, as it used to be called in those days. And so for the last 2% of our customers, instead of us going into our warehouse and picking the, the goods that they needed and delivering it to them, we said, here's your account. You go to the cash and carry and you pick your own. So in the end, we didn't have to lose any customers. But that's an example of customer profitability analysis. Let's look at one in Loomis. Remember, we're in the route business. We go to the bank, we pick up the cash, we go to all the retail, drop the cash off, and then we re re reverse the process in the evening. So. Now you're running Loomis, you're going to build a route for an armored car truck. You identify the stops you have for your route, you understand the cost for each stop, you want a margin for each stop, so now you price your stop based on your cost plus a margin. And your route's built. Now what you know is that if you could add a stop to the route, 
you're going to have an incremental return from that route. So your salespeople go out and they start selling more stops on those routes. And because the costs are already covered by the route, what the sales guys do, they sell the stops at incremental cost. We don't need to cover our full costs because they're already covered by the route. We'll pick up a new piece of business at incremental cost. And so <coughs> route density improves and the incremental revenue makes that route extra profitable. Of course, this is a mature industry. All your competitors are doing the exact same thing. So their route guys are going to your full cost stops and offering to put them on at incremental cost. Pretty soon, everybody's running routes at in incremental cost and nobody's got a full cost stop. Everybody's losing money. In Loomis, that was the situation with 30% of our business. 30% of our business was incrementally priced business. Took us a while to get over that one, I can tell you. So talking about profitability enhancement, those are a couple of examples. Um, I think that brings me, well, I, I, I suppose what we should say is we, we then wrap up all of those things and we can identify the uh, financial restructuring piece of the turnaround. I've, I've sort of talked about um, understanding the bank relationship and the additional sources of financing. And so that would bring you to the end of the turnaround plan and the beginning of the implementation process. I don't know how we're doing for time here. I have included in the deck a case study. I'm not sure if we have time to go through it or not. This is a business, uh, just for the sake of another example. This is a pet food manufacturing company. This company manufactured branded wet and dry pet food in Australia. It was acquired by a private equity uh, division of a bank. And shortly after it was acquired, there was a dramatic drop off in financial performance. And because it was a private equity deal, the balance sheet was highly leveraged. And because it had lots and lots of international sales, it also had a very large foreign exchange hedge book that had a lot of leverage in it. So leverage was a real problem here. The business was going to market with its own brands. And it was going to market in an environment where the big brand management companies controlled the shelf space. So Nestle and Master Foods were the big guys. And this company, a company called Bush's, had its own third level brand that it was trying to compete against the big guys with. The company operated four manufacturing plants and the prior CEO was really a sales guy. He was a guy that was one of these, any sales is a good sale kind of guy. Don't trouble me with the P&L. And so really there was no data around the business. The uh, four manufacturing plants each had different accounting systems. They each had a different approach to, to uh, standard cost um, and so data, like most turnarounds, was troublesome. In the pet food manufacturing business, you are really in the business of buying and managing commodities. You're buying meat, stuff that's a com uh, that, 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 that you can buy contracts for ways in advance if you want to manage your raw material cost. You're buying tin and, st and, and, and steel, stuff you can manage uh, a long ways in advance if you want to hedge your steel costs. Um, you have uh, I, I, I was uh, going to go through quite a lot of uh, the detail of what was wrong with the, with the production plants, but I think there's not enough time for that. Let me just get to the value proposition. We're talking about a, a, a tertiary branded company going out to battle the major brands and they're losing money. So what's the strategy you're going to adopt and if you're going in to turn this business around? The opportunity for Bush's and what really became its new value proposition was to embrace private label. It was difficult to compete against these branded companies. In Australia, the retail sector was highly consolidated. There were four major retailers in the whole country. 
And those retailers were interested in growing their private label products. They weren't so interested in having a third level brand on the shelf. So if we could get out of the branded business and become their private label manufacturer, suddenly we would be enormous. In the retail game, the retailers uh, provide shelf space to branded product companies based on the contribution the branded product companies give them to promotional activity. And so the more Master Foods and Nestle would provide a retailer with promotional uh, uh, value, the more shelf space they would get. And as soon as the retailer wanted to, to, to squeeze back, they would increase the size of shelf space dedicated to their private label stuff and, and push Master Foods and Nestle back down the shelf. Master Foods and Nestle would respond by offering more promotional money. And so there was this constant push back and forth between private label and branded product. The other thing about Australia was that we weren't used to private label in a premium sense. Private label in Australia used to mean the low end product, the substandard, the cheap product. In the rest of the world, private label has become not, not just premium, but sometimes super premium. Sometimes a, a house brand for a retailer is actually a higher value than the Nestle or the Master Food brand might represent. So there was this opportunity for Bushes to bring not only, private, not only to get out of making all these little runs of, of a branded product for itself, but to start manufacturing long runs of private label product for those retailers and to move the private label product up from being a, a base product to a premium and super premium product. And Bushes in the end became the largest private label manufacturer of pet food in Australia. We had a significant share of business in Europe, in the US, in Japan. We had 25% of the wet pet food business in Japan. And in the end, the Japanese came and bought the business to secure their supply. And that was the outcome of the, uh, of the Bush's story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. We really appreciate your time and, and coming up today.